there shall be signs in the sun, and in the moon, and in the stars, and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear, and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken. One man, one microphone, one mission. One message. True News, the only newscast reporting the countdown to the second coming of Jesus Christ. And now for the most powerful hour on radio, here is End Time Newsman, Rick Wiles. This is True News, one hour of uncensored news, views, and commentary. Welcome to the program. I'm Rick Wiles. Today is Monday, March 30, 2015. You know what kind of Monday it's going to be when the top story is that two drag queens ran the gate at Fort Meade, Maryland, near the entrance to the National Security Agency. A firefight ensued after the vehicle attempted to crash the gate. The vehicle contained two men dressed as women. One of the men was killed in the gunfight. The second man was shot in the chest and transported to the Maryland Shock Trauma Center in Baltimore. Of course, the FBI promptly said there was no indication that the incident was terrorism-related. For the record, Fort Meade has 11,000 military personnel and 29,000 civilian employees, mostly working at the NSA. The stream of American allies signing up as partners of China's new Asian infrastructure bank grew into a river last week, Denmark and Australia were the latest Western-allied nations to join with China. As expected, Russia is on board, too. India's Economic Times reported today that the U.S. hinted it may join the party, too. U.S. Treasury Secretary Jacob Liu is in China for talks with top Chinese officials. He met for four hours today in Beijing with China's premier. Following the Following the meeting, Mr. Liu said the U.S. is looking forward to cooperating with China's new bank. The sign-up deadline is tomorrow. The phraseology of saying that the U.S. is looking forward to cooperating with China's new bank was uh, received by many uh, watchers as a hint that the United States is going to capitulate and join China's new global bank. What does that mean? It means China is on top, and the U.S. is now a member of the China-led World Bank. Banks in Great Britain have been told by the Bank of England to prepare for a global financial crisis resulting from a major slowdown in China and Brazil. The Bank of England told U.K. banks that the slowdown could be so severe it may cause their largest business customers to collapse. The new stress test will force lenders to assess how they would cope in a scenario in which global growth goes into reverse. Goes into reverse. Isn't that that what they used to call a depression? Uh, The Times of London said that Bank of England regulators want to assess how a drying up in market liquidity will impact on the ability of traders to get into and out of a particular position and will tell the banks to assume at least two of their largest and most vulnerable trading partners are unable to repay money they owe. London's Telegraph said UK banks would be evaluated on the following scenarios. A global downturn that triggers widespread flight from risk across the markets, prompting an influx of money into U.S. assets, sending the dollar surging. A slump in oil to $38 a barrel, worsening deflation and spooking traders to the extent that liquidity in certain markets evaporate and a property crash in China as it attempts to rebalance its economy towards consumption for a further slowdown in the Eurozone with deflation increasing the size of the currency bloc's debt obligations. Meanwhile, European nations have been told that they will have to give up their independence and sovereignty and merge into a United States of Europe if they want the euro currency to survive. That's the advice from the Pacific Investment Management Company, the world's largest bond investor. 
Anonymous is threatening Israel with a cyber holocaust next week. Does Anonymous even exist? How would we know? It's a, it's Anonymous, right? Think about how crazy it is. A, a mysterious group that hides behind Guy Fawkes mask and calls itself Anonymous then threatens to do harm to nations. Anybody could be anonymous, or any intelligence agency could be anonymous, or any political group could be anonymous, or a secret society, a shadow government could be anonymous. How would we ever know? Well, anyway, I'll just go ahead with the scripted storyline of this next news article and pretend that I'm stupid and I don't have a brain to think. Here is the gist of the story. Anonymous has threatened to unleash a massive cyber attack on Israel one week from tomorrow, April 7. Here is the audio of the anonymous threat that was released today. Greetings, world. We are anonymous. This is a message to the foolish Zionist entities. We are coming back to punish you again for your crimes in the Palestinian territories. As we do every year on the 7th of April, all we see is continuous aggression, bombing, killing and kidnapping of the Palestinian people, as in the last war against Gaza, in 2014. We also see complete silence from other Arab and foreign countries. Although this is nothing new to us, we refuse to stand by idly. Our response to these heinous crimes against humanity will be on the 7th of April 2015. As we did many times, we'll take down your servers, government websites, Israeli military websites, banks, and public institutions. We'll erase you from cyberspace as we have every year. The 7th of April 2015 will be an electronic holocaust, a message to the youth of Palestine. You are a symbol of freedom, resistance, and hope. Never give up. Never give in. Never. We are with you, and will continue to defend you. Our message to the foolish Benjamin Netanyahu, and all leaders in the Zionist entities, as promised in previous attacks, we will continue to electronically attack until the people of Palestine are free. As shown in previous attacks, we will continue to invade and attack your devices, websites and personal data. To the government of Israel, you have not stopped your endless human right violations. You have not stopped illegal settlements. You killed thousand people as in the last war against Gaza in 2014. You have shown that you do not respect international law. This is why that on the 7th of April 2050, elite cyber squadrons from around the world will decide to unite in solidarity with the Palestinian people against Israel as one entity to disrupt and erase Israel from cyberspace. To the government of Israel, we always say expect us, but you always fail. We are unexpected. We'll show you. You on the 7th of April, 2015. What's the electronic holocaust? Holocaust. Me. We are anonymous. To the foolish Benjamin Netanyahu. And all Israeli leaders expect the unexpected. In the Middle East, John Kerry, our modern day Neville Chamberlain, is burning the midnight oil in Switzerland in his obsessive quest to sign a peace treaty with Iran. Tomorrow is the drop-dead deadline. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu warned Western powers that any agreement with Tehran would be seen as a reward for the country's aggression in Yemen. The Saudi Arabian-led Gulf Military Alliance imposed a blockade on Yemen's ports today, and a rebel group linked to al-Qaeda, and that means they're linked to Barack Obama and John McCain, too, uh, seized control of a key city in the northwest region of Syria. Mobile phone video footage showed rebel fighters ripping down and burning the Syrian flag. The Times of London reported that Iran is close to putting its forces on Israel's northeast border for the first time as its allies crush rebel groups in the Golan Heights area of Syria. The prospects of Iranian troops being posted on a frontier that has been calm for decades is causing alarm in Israel, according to the Times of uh, the London Times. And it comes as International negotiations over Iran's nuclear ambitions near a climax. Abu Ali, a fighter with Lebanon's 
Iranian-backed Hezbollah and who has served on multiple combat tours in, in Syria, told the Times, quote, Iran will be so close to the Israelis that it will no longer need long-range missiles to hit them, end of quote. Now, according to the Times, Israel deployed a new army division to the Golan Heights uh, in February last year in anticipation of the threat from an enemy that many see as a bigger worry than either ISIS or al-Qaeda. This is amazing what's happening. Uh, we've got Iranian troops on the border of Israel. While John Kerry is in Switzerland signing a peace treaty with the Iranians, the Saudi Arabians are leading and is a Sunni-dominated Arab army against Yemen, which is under assault by a Shiite-dominated rebel group backed by Iran. I mean, it looks like the Middle Eastern war is going to be a war between Arabs. It looks like the, the Muslims are going to duke it out first before everybody else gets involved. This this is really an amazing thing to watch. Also, I, I, I got a chuckle out of a story I saw in the Australian news that uh, an Australian government employee accidentally sent the passport information of Barack Obama and some other government leaders to um, somebody, I forget who it was, outside of the government. You know, can you imagine Barack Obama's passport information out, it was, is, is out there? Now, was it his American passport or was it his Indonesian passport? Or was it his Kenyan passport? Which one did they release? I'd like to see uh, those passport uh, numbers, wouldn't you? Well, let's take a short break. When I return, a former Muslim who is now serving Jesus Christ will join me uh, for the rest of the program. You're listening to True News. I'm Rick Wiles. You're listening to True News, the end time newscast. Rick will return after this announcement. We live in an ever-changing world where getting accurate, timely news and information is becoming increasingly difficult. The stranglehold by much of the mainstream media, let alone the total bias often exhibited by that media, creates a credibility issue. Today, people around the world faithfully tune into True News every weeknight for news, information, and inspiration they can't find anywhere else. Since 1999, True News has earned the reputation of being one of the world's leading sources from a Christian worldview. To help you stay connected to the news and information you need, True News has developed a free app for your smartphone that will give you news plus information about current and archived shows. We believe this app will become increasingly more valuable to you as we come closer to the day of our Lord's return. You can find the app at iTunes or Google Play. You can even find additional information at our website, truenews.com. That's T-R-U-N-E-W-S dot com. This is Max McLean. How does the Apostle Paul describe Jesus? Listen to the Bible from Colossians 1. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things. From Colossians 1, listen to the Bible. It's great for the soul. Welcome back to part two of True News for Monday, March 30, 2015. A Muslim cleric in Orlando, Florida is behind bars He's held on firearms violations. But what's scary about this story is that this guy is also facing federal prosecution for recruiting Florida Muslims to travel to the Middle East to be trained as terrorists, then return to the USA to kill Americans. Even more troublesome 
is the news that the U.S. Army issued an alert last Friday to American soldiers and their families to secure the locks on their doors and windows at their homes, to check the door peephole before opening it, and to remove personal information about their families from their social media pages. Elijah Abraham was born and grew up in Iraq as a Muslim. Today, he is a devout Christian. Mr. Abraham is the founder and president of Living Oasis Ministries. Elijah, welcome to True News. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you for having me today. Yes, sir. Um, Elijah, before we get into our discussion of of your ministry's uh, evangelization of of Muslims, I I want to uh, I want to get your comments on some of these uh, uh, late breaking news stories. You know, I mentioned in the introduction this uh, arrest and detaining of a man in Orlando, Florida, uh, a, a Muslim um, cleric who has uh, uh, been accused of recruiting Florida Muslims, taking them to the Middle East to be trained in terror tactics and then to bring them back to the United States to kill Americans. Um, What's your thought about this? Well, uh, it does not really surprise me because uh, this uh, kind of preaching and teaching in Islamic mosques uh, in the United States, been going on for at least 35, 40 years. Uh, just now, we are seeing some of the fruit of their labor, um, uh, and the problem is that we have not vetted uh, these individuals, these imams who are coming to the United States uh, and teaching this kind of teaching. Uh, to my understanding, this man in question that you're talking about, uh, he's from uh, New York. He was a, a gang member or head of gang members, uh, and uh, he's an American, a black individual who converted to Islam. Uh, at some certain point when he converted, uh, he was taught the Wahhabi, the Muslim Brotherhood type of teaching of Islam. Uh, he did not, uh, he was not born a radical. Um, he became a radical later. Uh, so the, the issue needs to go back a little bit further. Uh, what kind of teaching was he taught, and who brought that kind of teaching to the United States? Uh, it goes back into the Wahhabi, the Muslim Brotherhood um, uh, type of theology that uh, really initiated from Saudi Arabia as well as uh, Egypt, because Muslim Brotherhood are in Egypt. Uh, the Wahhabi teaching are in um, uh, Saudi Arabia. Uh, I don't know if you knew this or not, but Saudi Arabia uh, spends approximately $120, $130 million every three days in expanding Wahhabi theology worldwide. $120 uh, million every three days? Yeah, average. Uh, so every time you and I and everybody in your uh, audience put in money, uh, put in gas in their car, they basically fund in Wahhabi expansionism because all of that petrodollar money going and expanding Islam uh, and that kind of theology worldwide. I travel around the world, and I see the devastating effects of that kind of theology. Um, and here in America, it's been a stealth uh, type of expansionism, um, but unfortunately our nation are uh, putting the blinders on. They don't want to see it. Uh, they put in the headphones on. They don't want to hear it. Uh, not just the political side of uh, the spectrum in here in the United States, but I'm talking about the, with the evangelical uh, uh, churches. They don't want to hear this truth. Uh, for some reason or another, uh, of course, I have my, my conclusions why they don't want to hear it. But uh, that might be for another interview. No, we're going uh, to talk about it in this interview. Um, you know, uh, Elijah, you know, this, this uh, Orlando case, you know, for me personally, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's quite unsettling because my office, I'm sitting at the intersection of two highways that take you to Orlando, Florida, in less than 90 minutes. Um, we've had uh, various times uh, that there have been Islamic people uh, in our parking lot uh, several years ago. I came here in the evening and found two two Muslims uh, with prayer mats on the parking lot praying to Allah. Uh, a few days ago, there, were, uh, there, were, there was a car uh, parked here with several uh, Islamic men in the vehicle. You know, so I'm always um, aware of my surroundings. And, you know, so when I saw this article, you know, we've got an, uh, basically an ISIS recruiter Right. In Orlando, 90 minutes away, and I'm thinking, you mean there are that many Muslims in Orlando 
that are oh, yes. that you can recruit yeah. and send to the yeah. Middle East to learn how to kill Americans? I mean, that is chilling. Right. Uh, it it is, and you just now finding out about it. It's been going on for a long time in Florida. Uh, I don't live in Florida, but I do follow what's going on in the nation, as far as the Islamic agenda and the expansion and so forth and tactics. Uh, but Florida, yes, uh, Jacksonville, Florida, uh, Miami. You got uh, uh, Tampa, uh, Orlando, of course. Uh, so we have you have an issue. A few years back, I think in mid 2000s, like 2005, 2006, they arrested about four or five individuals in Florida. I forgot who exactly which city, who were recruited or first converted to Islam in prison and recruited in prison, and they were uh, a sleeper cell, were uh, trying to uh, start a bombing. Uh, spree. So praise God that uh, the FBI caught on to them and arrested them. And this is in Florida. But here's something I, I want to mention, something that you mentioned earlier about uh, you, you saw some Muslims praying in the parking lot. Mm-hmm. There is a trend happening in the nation, and especially on church grounds and parking lots uh, and grassy area and churches, that Muslims are praying on the properties uh, on these parking lots and these churches. There is a doctrine in Islam and says that wherever you put your mat on and you pray, you are claiming that particular real estate for Allah, and now it belongs to Allah. So you need to understand something. Your church, your property, wherever you are now, uh, your studio or whatever, your parking lot now, it belongs to Allah, whether you like it or not, as far as they're concerned, is being reclaimed. Uh, churches, a um, uh, number of ch- pastors called me, and they said, hey, we saw this happening. What's all of that mm-hmm. all about? So I, I, uh, Elijah, that I, I, know, I know a Baptist pastor in Stephenville, Texas, and, you know, you got to know where Stephenville's at. Uh, I, I mean, know exactly where it's at. You know where you've been to Stephenville? Oh, yes. All right. I, I preached there at one time, yes, okay. a long time ago. All right, so you, you know the, the general... Um, uh, environment of Stephenville, um, yes. uh, but I, I know I know a Baptist pastor out there, and, and he had a Muslim showing up, uh, praying on the church lawn day after day yeah. after day, and he had to, you know, he had to call uh, the you know Texas uh, state trooper to come and remove this guy. Right, right, and there's something you need to understand. You need to go back to uh, September 25th, 2009. Something happened in Washington, D.C. Uh, they called it Islam on Capitol Hill. Uh, during that time, uh, the promotion was from the Muslim community is that we're going to have 50,000 Muslims to come and pray for the nation, pray solidarity with the United States, blah, blah, blah. Well, only about four or 5,000 showed up. The liberal media looked at this ah, was, a, was a failure because only four or 5,000 showed up. But that's not the point. The point was they have sent a signal to the Muslim world that the conquer of America already began, and the particular real estate uh, property that they preyed on on Capitol Hill now is, belongs to Allah. It's a Muslim property. So uh, we have to look at it from their theology, from their doctrine, and how they implement in this. For example, there is a doctrine called doctrine of abrogation. Abrogation, when Muhammad received his revelation of the Quran, there was earlier revelation and latter revelation. The early in Mecca, the latter in Medina. According to the abrogation doctrine, it says the Medina or the latter revelation will negate or um, uh, negate the uh, or do away with the earlier revelation. So the earlier revelation were all peaceful, uh, peaceful towards the Jews, the Christians, and everybody else. So uh, all the re- verses are nice and uh, good to hear. But the latter revelation in Medina, that's what he established jihad, is the violent uh, revelation, which means what they live by, the true Quran, is they live by the latter, not the early. But in the United States, when you see an imam or a Muslim scholar or care representative, Council on American Islamic Relations on Fox News and CNN and so forth, they recite the early revelation, the peaceful verses, and they try to distance themselves from, quote-unquote, ISIS or Muslim Brotherhood, or the violent, they say, oh, they don't represent Islam. They hijacked Islam. Well, that's part of the abrogation. And also there is a doctrine called taqiyya, which means deception. That's part of the deception. What they're trying to do uh, in a low-information people in, the, in America, they'll say, oh, see, look, 
their verses from the Quran so peaceful. Why are we so mad at them? And that's part of the deception happening in our nation. And we have uh, administration in our nation that is very much pro-Islam, uh, advancing Islam, put it on steroids, basically. And you got a media who are um, the liberal media, definitely in the tank for Islamic agenda. The a lot of uh, other quote unquote um, uh, you know non-biased uh, media, which I don't think is there is such thing non-biased media uh, on television. Even Fox News, they have some bias about certain things. They're scared to talk about it. Uh, even now, with the German airline, that uh, this guy, the co-pilot, uh, you know, crashed the airplane. Uh, just last night, I found out that uh, he converted to Islam. Now, where where is the media? Where are they? T- how come they're not talking about it? All they talk about is, oh well, he had psychological problems and he was in the hospital for psychological issues. They're not going to talk about this Islamic conversion. Where did you find the information that he converted to Islam? Because I'll be gla- I'll that be gla- I'll send be glad it to, to me. Send you the link. Because yeah. because I have looked, and uh, the mainstream news media will not talk about it. They only talk about his psychological it. problems. You um, need to understand, he got his training in, in uh, Arizona, pilot training as well. And that Arizona, that's where uh, the uh, uh, one of the uh, Atta, Muhammad Atta, the guy in 9-11, mm-hmm. uh, got his li- uh, pilot license training and so forth. So there is a mosque there. There is a training there. So uh, we have issues that nobody wants to connect the dots here. Elijah, the, the other article that uh, came out uh, yesterday that's very chilling uh, is that the U.S. military alerted American soldiers uh, to fortify the locks on their doors and windows right? to remove right. all personal information about their coming and going and their families from the Internet, a number of security measures. We're talking about American soldiers, their homes here in the United States of America. This, right. this is right. absolutely chilling that that well, our troops are now being targeted, their families, their wives, their children. Several months ago, uh, you know, there was an ISIS group that posted on a website uh, referring to Canadian forces saying, we will decapitate your wives in their own right. bed. Right. Right. Uh, it, it, again, you have to look at it from the bigger picture. Uh, the big picture is that we are fighting a politically correct war. They are not unleashing our full forces to really decimate this kind of uh, ideology. And I don't look at Islam as a religion. It's an ideology. It's a sociopolitical system that uses a deity that is Allah to advance his agenda. And unless we recategorize what Islam is instead of a religion to a political ideology, just it's like an ism. Nazism, it's an ism. We will, yeah, we will not win this war, whether we like it or not. We are losing already. So, as far as political correctness, the way we are dealing with Islam in the United States, instead of nipping it in the butt here from all aspects, from the financial, the educational, from the political, as well as the spiritual, in the United States. This will not happen for the, uh, the Defense Department giving a warning to our armed forces. Um, that really makes, him, makes me upset because I am very much pro-veterans, uh, pro-armed um, uh, forces. Because of the sacrifice that they have made, that I live the life that I live here in the United States, and I praise God that I'm here in the United States. I accepted Christ here in the United States because of the freedoms that the United States offers. Now the people who are fighting for our freedom, now they have to lock their doors and, and watch out for a boogeyman that is coming in the middle of the night to their home. That should not have happened. The only reason that it's happening is because our own government allowing this to happen. It, I look, I, I say a lot of things that get me in trouble a lot, <laughs> but it's all true. And that is, I truly believe current administration right, at, right now aiding and abetting the, uh, the Islamic agenda which is the enemy to this country. My, call it, back, my name for him is Jihad Barry. To call it treason. I mean, he's Jihad Barry. Yeah. He, he yeah. is a jihadist, in my opinion. Barack Obama is yeah. an avowed jihadist. That's right. And he's practicing taqiyya, deception. Um, Elijah, uh, I had an epiphany moment in 1998 when my eyes were open and suddenly I realized uh, most of the stuff I was being told uh, was a big fat lie. And, and 
you know, I've been on a learning um, experience ever since. And it was in 98 that I became aware, and I was I was living in Dallas-Fort Worth at the time. It was in 98 that I became aware of the Islamic infiltration in America and that Dallas Fort Worth had a hot was a hotbed of yeah. Islamic uh, radicals uh, in fact the uh, the lieutenant to Osama bin Laden was working at a at a tire store in Arlington Texas and so I yeah. started I started speaking out in in the Dallas Fort Worth Metroplex in the, in, in 98 and 99 2000 and I was speaking in churches and holding my own events and um, you know, I was followed by Muslim men everywhere I went, yep. wherever I spoke. But here we are in 2000, 2015, and I'm still shocked that so few Christian leaders are aware of what's going on and are willing to deal with it. Well, you just push a hot button in me. <laughs> um, I'm sure you've been persecuted for what you've been speaking since then. I have been persecuted for what I've been speaking uh, way even before that uh, about exposing the Islamic agenda, not just from the Muslim community. Look, I expect that from the Muslim community. I'm talking about from the Christian community. Um, You need to understand something that a lot of pastors don't know their constitutional rights. And majority of pastors, not all, but majority of pastors believe that they cannot exist as pastors and as a church without the 501c3 nonprofit status. Now, my challenge to every pastor, whoever listens to me right now on the radio, my challenge is, could you please answer me one question? How come the Church of the Living God survived for 1950 years without the IRS? How come now, the last 50 years, we cannot have a church without a document from a heathen institution called IRS that we cannot be established as a church. Come on, preach it now. Tell them, tell the truth. Keep it go, Keep going. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, the, the Constitution automatically gives any group who uh, establish as a church automatically they tax exempt. They don't need a 501c3. They need to go back in history. Look, I was not even born in the United States, but I know the history how the 501c3 was established. It was established by Lyndon B. Johnson to keep the church silent because he was a crooked politician, what, what, and there were pastors who were calling him out. Elijah, when, when, so, a, when a church voluntarily submits a 501c3 application, that is the equivalent— That a state church. That is the equivalent of selling your birthright for a bowl of porridge. That's right. That's right. And I have been in churches where they refuse to have a 501c3 status, and God bless them. Man, you talk about the breath of fresh air. We need more churches like that. So back to your original question, why would pastors not want to talk about these issues? Because of the 501c3, they see as Islam, oh, this is a political issue. We should not be talking about that. Yes, Islam is a political ideology, but also has a religious element, which means it has a spiritual element. And we as pastors in our churches, as preachers, we are called to be prophets of God. And that means a prophet not telling the future, but telling what is happening in black and white and not be ashamed of the gospel and expose darkness. Islam is darkness. So this is a spiritual storm that we are facing in America. You're talking about homosexuality, um, you know, gay rights and all of that. That's a spiritual storm as well. But Islam is one of these storms as well. And for pastors to refuse to know about Islam and refuse to educate their people about Islam and refuse to engage Islam with the gospel by winning Muslims' heart to the Lord, they are not doing their job as shepherds of, of God's flock, and they're not doing their job as uh, pastors as well as church leaders. And to me, uh, to me, uh, they're going to be held accountable to God, not to me. Uh, I'm doing what I'm doing. You're doing what you're doing. But pastors need to have a little bit of backbone and say, you know what, enough is enough. I've been rolled over so many times. I'm sick and tired of this. Uh, I, am, I don't want 501c3. To this day, these churches who I have, or that I've been in, they don't have 501c3. They still give issue a document uh, to their congregation when they give um, money, a tithe, and that's their tax deduction. The IRS have not taken any church uh, who do not have 501c3 to court for not having 501c3. Well, Elijah, so I do it, not understand. Elijah, if, doing, if, if why, you, I don't know. If you go to the IRS website and look at their documents on 
churches and nonprofit organizations. It says right there in black and white on the IRS website, churches are automatically tax exempt. Right. And, then, and then it says right. some churches may choose to to file for a 501c3 status, basically right. for um, pleasing the you know the world, just to show everybody hey we have it. But it clearly says on the IRS website, churches are automatically tax exempt. I had a years ago. I had a a well known CPA who who is. Uh, uh, does a lot of work with churches around the world, around the nation, and he told me privately that there that the IRS has two lists. There, they have a list of five hundred one c three churches, and then they have a list of churches that have not filed a five hundred one c three. And guess what they call those churches? Constitutional churches, because the oh. IRS the IRS knows those pastors and those congregations know their constitutional rights. Right. And they right. list them as constitutional churches. I'm sure you're aware of the Black Robe Regiment back in the Absolutely. Revolutionary War. So uh, this is our this is our heritage, and our our pastors staying away from our nation heritage uh, and adopting a Western uh, secular philosophy that we should adhere to big government and how they legislate the church. Look, I know this is big talk, what I'm saying here. A lot of pastors get mad at me by saying this. But we need to—we are in an age where pastors should—we cannot afford, as Christians, we cannot afford to be weak. We cannot afford it, because I am seeing our Christian brothers and sisters slaughtered in the Middle East and other parts of the world. And they are standing up for the truth. They are not backing down. And could you imagine when persecution comes to the United States, which is already happening— but if it comes down to the, that level, uh, Christians don't know how to handle persecution. Now, right they now, right now, they're just they call, they're, they're calling us yeah. names, and you know that that's the level of persecution right now. They're probably, you know, they're 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 prosecuting a few people on certain issues, but that's the extent of the persecution. But what's happening in the Middle East in in Africa is real persecution, and it's You're always not. at the hands of Muslims. Right. Right. And that's, uh, you know, with the, with, the, with the church not engaging Islam with the gospel, is really out of fear. It's unfounded fear. That, and they don't want individuals like me to come uh, and educate them, say, look, Jesus Christ, you need to understand something. Jesus Christ did not die for Islam. He died for the Muslim. Just like he died for me when I was a Muslim, now look how God is using me. So the church needs to have that vision. Also, you need to understand, what is the spirit of Islam? We have to dig deeper and to find out what is the spirit of Islam. Let the Word of God speak for what the spirit of Islam is. You need to go First John chapter 4, verse 1 through 4. That passage, it's a warning. It's a discerning passage. Rather, it says, if any spirit confess Jesus Christ came in the flesh, it's not, it, it is from God. But if it denies Jesus came in the flesh, it's not from God, and this is the spirit of the Antichrist. Well, Islam denies Jesus came in the flesh, denies the Trinity, denies the authenticity of the Scripture, denies the death and burial resurrection of Christ. So according to the passage, 1 John chapter 4, verse 1 through 4, the spirit of Islam is an antichrist spirit. So for us, pastors, churches, missionaries, uh, we need to be aware of what kind of spirit we're dealing with. The only way to combat that kind of spirit is by presenting the gospel in love, with boldness, with apologetics, defending the faith to Muslims that God is bringing to the United States. Look, whether we like it or not, Muslims are here, and they are coming by the plane load. Whether we like it or not, politically, economically, whatever it is, that's out of my hands. I'm not the president. If I'm the president, give me one one term, I'll change a lot of things. <laughs> but because they're here, the church needs to step up in the, in the plate, to the plate and stand in the gap and be bold and share the gospel with the Muslims that's in our neighborhoods. Now, because of fear of many Christians that I, when I do the seminars in American churches, they say, well, I don't know who's my neighbor. Maybe my neighbor is an al-Qaeda or a terrorist. I really don't care. Even terrorists need Jesus. The only reason the terrorist does what he does is because the promise that of assurance of salvation, that when he dies in the process of uh, jihad, he's going to have a guarantee to go to paradise. Now, we as Christians, we have an alternative, and that is John 3.16. Nobody, Jesus did not ask you or me or any Christian to pick up a machete and cut, cut off somebody's head and die in the process that we have eternal life with him in, in heaven. No. 
He said, look, I'll doctor you. I'll have my creation to doctor you, and it's a free gift. And that's the, uh, that's the awesome message that we have to Muslims. And the church is refusing to engage Islam with the gospel. And we, do you want to see the result of the church not involved in this kind of evangelism? Just look at Europe. I just got back from Europe last week. And you, you'll be sad to see the status of the church. Not just apathy, it's cold, it's half dead. I'm talking about evangelical churches, not the quote-unquote orthodox or Catholic or whatever. I'm talking about the evangelical churches. They're very much secular-minded. They have no desire for evangelism. They have no desire to preach the gospel. Yeah, they preach the gospel in churches, get together, but that's far as it goes. And you're talking about close to 52 million Muslims now in uh, Europe. Europe, uh, give it another 50 years, at least two or three countries out of Europe will become uh, Muslim nations just by vote. So, and they have more children than the average uh, European. The European childbirth is about 1.3 childbirth. That's irreversible to correct that, that culture. The Muslim childbirth is 8.1. In the United States, the bare minimum is uh, 2.11. The average childbirth of, of Muslims in America, at least 8 to 8.5. So it, you look at the Christian family. How many children uh, Christian families are having now? Now, back 50 years ago, the average household in a Christian family, about five or six children. Now the average is about one to two. Now, why is that? Because you're talking about we have dual Christianity in America. We have American Christianity which is the majority of churches, and we have the biblical Christianity, which is the minority of churches. The American Christianity, the reason I call it American, not biblical, because they allowed the culture to influence the church instead of the church influencing the culture. That's right. That the, the, establish, childbirth. the establishment has spent the last 40 years telling the American people and the Europeans uh, the, the planet is overpopulated. We have too many right. people. You need to stop having children. Right, and the Christian families have bought into that lie. And the thing, the, the, the excuse, the majority of the excuse that I hear, not just in America, but also in Europe, about why, and I bring this up about, tell me why you're not having children. And the number one reason is economic. I can, we cannot afford it. And my challenge to that is, wait a minute, if God is going to bless you with a child, don't you think God will make sure that you take care of your child? It's like, it's like a faith. Look, I have four children right now, and I'm working on number five. I will continue working on number six and number seven and number eight until Jesus says enough. <laughs> so, so it's one of those things that, do, can I afford four children? I'm a missionary. I live by faith. No, I can't from a human perspective. But I trust the Lord. He is my provider. He's my savior. He's my, he's my comforter. I have to trust him to take care of my family. Elijah, you know you- what? We live very well, we eat very well, and we have a roof over our shoulder. We have a car to take us, old cars, to take us where we need to go. That's all we need. Elijah, when you fly across America, coast to coast, on a clear day, and you can see the the ground below, uh, does it look like we're overpopulated? (laughs) No way. (laughs) I'm always amazed at the vast amount of uninhabited territory in in North America. That's right. I mean, my goodness, uh, you know, you want some acreage, come, into, come to my neck of the woods. You can buy as many acres as you want. So it's unbelievable. It's a lie. It's a lie. And, and the church, and again, from the, from the pulpit, we are not exposing these lies, not just in Islam, from secularism, uh, the, uh, the elite, the, uh, the globalists. I mean, all of this, you have to look at Islam as being used as a pawn by the globalist agenda. It's a boogeyman. And the, the thing is trying to create a, te- uh, a terrorist, global terrorism uh, to the point, to the level where the humanity on planet Earth to beg the globalists for peace and security. Once that happens, the globalists will say, you know what, okay, we'll provide uh, peace and security and health insurance and financial stability, but you have to give us your right. Now we own you. And that's really what the plan is. All right, I want uh, let's, let's go to bring in the uh, the antichrist. All right, you just now you're pushing my hot button there. Okay, ah. <laughs> all right. So so okay. we're gonna we're gonna run this interview a few more minutes longer because I am convinced that that the new world order boys, the shadow government, whatever you want to call these right freaks, all right they they are 
del- they are the force behind the rise of Islam. They are using Islam, Islamic jihadist violence, to advance the new world order. That they th- they are steering this thing, um, yeah. and um, you know it's it's it, they they are fueling everywhere you. I have watched this for years. You there is a clear connection between many terrorist events and various Western intelligence agencies. You cannot right. deny it. You got to be stone right. cold dead in the head not to see what's going on. Well, I mean, you have to understand about ISIS and how they came about and where did they get their money, where did they get their weaponry and all of that stuff. You have to look at, okay, they were an unknown, small little bit of faction from, from Iraq, Al-Qaeda. Next thing you know, uh, they're part of, quote-unquote, anti-Assad resistance group. Uh, John McCain flies to Syria and holds uh, shoulder to shoulder to with these guys, now we are fighting. He said, these are my brothers. We need to give them weapons. We need to give them money. So the United States gives them half a billion dollars, if not more, of money, as well as weapons that it's being smuggled from Benghazi to Turkey to Syria. Of course, that's not a gun running operation. Uh, our, our ambassador was doing in Benghazi, of course. So all of that, um, of course, we aided and abated these guys. Why, why, now, is, why is McCain to... so cozy with these terrorists and the Muslim Brotherhood? Why? John McCain, why? You, you have to. You have to understand, he's a globalist as well. He's, uh, I, I have no trust of this man. I think this man needs to be put out to pasture or retire, and somebody else needs to run it in, in his place. We have uh, Lindsey Graham, another guy. They're, all of these guys, these rhinos, need to be just put out to pasture. They have not helped this nation at all. Um, and and what... again, uh, you know, when I speak in churches and I talk about these issues and I kind of joke around, I said, do you think I should run for president? <laughs> Everybody kind of laughs about it. They say, yeah, yeah, yeah. I say, you know what? I don't have to prove where I was born. It's already been done. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Do, yeah. Where? I mean, were you born in the USA? No, sir. Well, you're qualified now. I was, qualified born, in ba- now. I was uh, born in Baghdad. I was born in Baghdad, Iraq. Hey, well, you you're as qualified as Barack Obama and Ted Cruz. You got it. I know more about uh, national security and sta- uh, foreign policy than Hillary Clinton and Obama together. And I'm, I'm not, I know you do, too. <laughs> yeah, but the people who know what's going on are ne- never going to be permitted to to no. hold public no. office. The, there okay, are Tom no Cruz, elections. Tom, there are Tom no free Cruz elections in America. To, yeah, Tom Cruise announced to uh, to run. Do you really think he's going to win? Absolutely not. Uh, he does not have the money. Uh, he does not have the media on his side. Uh, the elite, the globalists, already uh, have someone in mind. And they will promote that to someone. What really makes a difference, a Republican or Democrat? Uh, because the global elites don't care. Because if you go to the, the three major globalist uh, organizations, or they, they used to be called uh, secret societies. They're no longer secret societies. They're now uh, think tanks. you got the CFR, Council of Foreign Relations, the Trilateral Commission, and the Bilderberg. If you go to these meetings, you'll see a Democrat and a Republican sitting side by side having the same agenda. Hey, imagine so, if imagine if we had elected John McCain in 2008. This is oh what my goodness, hey, okay, imagine? okay, now think about it. This is what we have we this is what we would have gotten if we had elected the Republican John McCain. We would have gotten open borders and amnesty of illegal immigrants, right? We would have gotten right. more wars, right? right. Uh, we right. would have we would have uh, armed uh, al-Qaeda in Syria, right? Right. We would have armed Al Qaeda and ISIS in in Benghazi, right? Well, wait a minute. Right. That's the same thing we got with Barack Obama. That's exactly right. And what we've done with Barack Obama, we have given Iraq to Iran in a silver platter. Uh, we have thirty thousand troops, Iranian troops, in Iraq as we speak right now. We have our own air force given air cover and reconnaissance uh, to Iranian troops in Iraq fighting, quote-unquote, ISIS. So this is what we are seeing. It is just unbelievably treasonous. But who's going to call them? Who, who's going to hold them accountable? Do you think the Congress will? You and me. Will? You and me. So We're doing well, it. Well, you and me, but the, the people that we elect, and they promise us the world when they get running for election, when they get elected, they said, you know, forget it. I'm not going to do what you do, what you elected me to do. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, what do you call it, the majority leader, uh, Mitch McConnell, 
I was in Kentucky at the time preaching, uh, speaking to Pastor's Conference during the ele- uh, just before the election. Man, you should have heard his, his uh, campaign slogans and so forth. Once he got on board, and uh, now he got reelected, now he's the majority leader. All of the promises that he promises are all gone. No, oh, he's, a, he's a sad little puppy. Yeah, and you got John Boehner, forget that. So who, who are you going to— The corruption, uh, Elijah, the corruption is so deep that the entire Washington landscape is bought off. Now, people ask me, I said, okay, you just painted a scary picture for me, and you scared the living that out of me. I said, no, I'm not here to scare you. I'm here to awaken you. But here's something we need to understand something. This issue with Islam and its terrorism and jihad and all of that, it's not going to be solved on the federal level. It needs to be solved on the local level. What I'm talking about local, I'm talking about the, the city council in Orlando and in your city. Uh, I'm talking about the state legislation. That's where the battle is. This is where we need to stop it locally because the federal government is not listening to you and me. Uh, the Congress not listening to you and me. Even though they come and um, you know promise the moon, but they're doing exactly what Machiavelli says: you promise everything until you get to a position of power and you implement your agenda. And that's exactly what it is—a communistic idea. Uh, it's not just the Republic, uh, the Democrats, Republicans as well. They went all the way far left uh, in this issue. You got few Republicans who are standing up for the truth, but they're the minority. They've been. Um, uh, you know, uh, pr- persecuted by fellow Republicans. But really what needs to happen is at the city and state level. Uh, pa- uh, I don't know about Florida, but uh, the number of uh, uh, states have passed laws, what's called ALAC, which is American Law for American Courts. So that means to prevent Sharia law to be used uh, by American uh, courts. There was a judge in Florida back uh, 2010 or 2011 he used Sharia law to arbitrate between two Muslims. This is not just in Florida, in Fort Worth, Texas in 2008. You got to other places. So the state needs to protect the Constitution within the state because the federal government will not do it. You know, Elijah, you know, here's what it comes down to in my mind. You know, all the ungodly people are coming out of the closet. All right. I mean, they're all out of the closet and they're they're strutting their stuff in public. They're proud of their sin. They're proud of their rebellion against God. They're 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 out in the open and they're proud of it now. Right. Isn't it time that God's people come out of their closet and start praising God in open? Why are we? This is the only thing left to do. Get out in public and praise the name of Jesus Christ. The, the issue here is really not uh, the sin. It's not darkness. Darkness just acts as itself. The issue, the problem is with the light. The, the, light with, yes. light shining. the withdrawal so of the, light. That's right. So the, the reason that they are now emboldened and they are celebrating their sin because back in the old days, who was the, the keeping check of all of these things? The pastors, the local church. When the church was silent, uh, silenced by the 501c3, especially in, in the 60s, uh, we are reaping what we have not sown. Uh, you know, we have not sown the gospel to a point where it's been assault and light in this nation. We did the opposite well, because we were silent. So now uh, we have become neutered from uh, preaching boldly and speaking boldly. Granted, praise God for the preachers who are on television, who are speaking out, like Robert Jeffords and others. They, they are speaking out, but they're so minority. And Franklin Me, Graham, I'll tell you what, I'm really... Franklin Graham, I really I, appreciate what he's saying. Yes, he is not so, backing down. Praise God. We need other pastors to come alongside of Franklin Graham and other, uh, Robert Jeffers and others to say, you know what, we stand be- beside you. We will more mobilize our churches. Our churches are voters as well, and we will hold our people accountable. See, the the politicians, they come and beg and kiss uh, uh, the church's feet once they get to get elected. But the the church really holds these guys accountable and say, look, we give you two years. If you don't do anything, we'll find we have another person. We will hold you accountable. We have a contract. We want you to sign a contract with us uh, that if you adhere to this, you promote this, we'll vote for you. We'll fight for you. But if you don't, we'll get you out. But, Elijah, it's it's got to go beyond the political realm right 
We right. have we to, to speak the. We got to go beyond praying. We've got to come right. outside and speak the name of Jesus Christ. The devils will flee if we will speak That's the right. name of Jesus. That's right. And you know what? Uh, many people tried to silence me, and I. My answer to that is: Look, I lived under Saddam Hussein, and I understand very well of what it means to live in a state police country, a uh, uh, police state country, and. Uh, be silent. I could not even think out loud uh, to speak my mind. Now I have this wonderful freedom that I'm speaking my mind. Whether you agree with it or not, at least give me the courtesy to say he's got the uh, religious liberty and freedom of speech to speak his mind. For someone to tell me I need to stop saying what I'm saying, uh, no. My answer is no way. Until they take, they put me in prison for saying these things, I'm going to continue saying what I'm saying because that's my religious liberty. That's my freedom of speech. I will continue to preach the gospel. I don't care if it's a Republican or Democrat, Muslims or secular. It makes no difference to tell me I should not preach the name of Jesus. Don't worry, because my boss is the Lord Jesus, not American citizenship. And that's Amen. something we, as, a, as Christians, the American Christianity, the majority of people in American Christian, uh, Christianity, they are American citizens first, Christians second. If I go and preach in church in the pastor's conference and I tell them, so look, if you invite me, um, we need to be aware about the Islamic agenda and this and that and the, free, uh, the uh, freedom, uh, the, the threat to your constitution, man, I get invited right and left. But if I ask them, so please invite me so I can teach you how to reach Muslims for Christ, crickets, I don't get invitations. Why? Because they are more of American citizens. They're nationalistic, their patriotism, number one, but being a Christian, an evangelist, that's not even number two. So, but we have to look at this. For those who listen to me on the radio as we speak right now, I pray that they would not get the wrong message that I am hostile to Muslims. I love Muslims. My family are still Muslims. I share the gospel with Muslims all the time. We need to be equipped how to reach Muslims for Christ. But we need to be aware and know that Islam is a spirit. It's an antichrist spirit. It's here to steal and kill and destroy, not just in our nation, but globally, because this is a global problem. That's why I travel around the globe, uh, equipping the global church. Our ministry outside the United States is being mainly equipping the church. In the United States, the church refused to be equipped. So our ministry within the United States is basically um, awakening the church, raising awareness of what's happening and calling for repentance. My message is to get out of American Christianity. Let's go back to biblical Christianity. Let us repent. Let us see God's face, because God is not happy with our nation. He is not happy with our churches, because we have been silent, and we have killed close to 60 million unborn children. And God is not going to stand aside and say, okay, you killed my creation, and, and I will still bless your nation. Are you kidding me? He gave us Obama. This is what's happening. Well, Elijah... You will never be silenced on True News, and you've got a standing invitation to come back anytime and speak boldly, speak the truth. My guest, Elijah Abraham, he's the executive director of Living Oasis Ministries, the website livingoasis.org. God bless you, Elijah. Appreciate you being here today. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. God bless you. Well, I agree with him that Barack Obama is part of the judgment of the United States of America. Uh, he, I've said for years, he is our Egyptian pharaoh that has been placed here to uh, persecute us. Here's why. Throughout history, God's people have never gotten up and done what they're supposed to do until there is persecution that drives them out of their comfort zones. That's what's happening right now. The answer isn't to take up arms. It is not politics. It is to preach the gospel. 